Okay, live from Nashville, it's your lecture. All right, hi guys. We're gonna go ahead and get into this. One of the first things I wanna talk about is an autoimmune condition. And I would hope to know that you could figure it out first by looking at these celebrities and thinking what do they all have in common? The disease particularly that I'm talking about is what they have in common, not the fact that they're celebrities. Um, this is Tony Braxton. This would be Selena Gomez and that is Seal. Think on it, wait for it. The answer is lupus. In fact, um, these two have the SLE, which is the systemic lupus erythematosus. And he actually, um, at a very young age, came down with discoid lupus, which is um, just only uh, related to your skin or cutaneous um, developments, nothing uh, systemic like these two have. Um, Selena Gomez just became diagnosed and finished up a round of chemotherapy for hers. And Tony Braxton here was diagnosed at 15. I think I believe her uncle died of it and her and her brother actually have systemic lupus. And uh, I know in, I believe it was 2008, she actually collapsed on stage because the lupus was attacking her heart. I think she had pericarditis because that's one thing that lupus does to your heart. So we're gonna get, talk a little bit more about this and figure out what you need to know for somebody that you're caring for that has lupus, okay? So stay tuned, here we go. Here we go. Okay, so I will mention that lupus is very hard to describe and, and just give a nice summary for you, you know, kind of a black and white picture of what lupus is and what it isn't. However, lupus comes in very many shapes and forms. So the main thing you need to know is that it is chronic, it cannot be cured, and many times um, it's progressive. So you can have like a mild form of it and then just over a long period of time, the person can get worse and worse. And when I say worse, we talk about uh, more and more flare-ups because this disease comes in and out of a person's life. A lot of things can precipitate what causes a flare-up, but many times it is just acute. It is all at once. You know, it may not be precipitated by anything like stress or diet. And other times it's very uh, slow and it progresses, you know, kind of unbeknownst to the person before you know it, they're in a full-blown flare-up. But what is critical is that in systemic lupus, um, not, the discoid, not the discoid type, it can cause major body organ failure, particularly the kidneys. Um, they're most susceptible to what lupus does. I don't think I mentioned what lupus is, actually. Let me rewind. Whoop, rewind. Okay, press play. Okay, good. So lupus, it's an autoimmune disorder, and I don't know why, but the body creates these little immune complexes and it attacks itself and it causes chronic vasculitis. And vasculitis is inflammation of the, the vessels and literally um, anywhere you can think of a vessel, it's gonna be affected. The, the kidneys is what I was mentioning earlier is most affected by this vasculitis, unfortunately. You can have this vasculitis in a couple other organs, particularly the, the heart. So your patient will develop pericarditis just because of the vessels um, spasming and swelling up to uh, in response to these autoimmune complexes. Another system is um, the central nervous system. So a lot of times they'll have some neurologic manifestations, which we can get into in just a second, and the joints. The joints are often affected in somebody who has uh, lupus. As I mentioned just a moment ago, they're not really sure what is the, the basis of the disease, like where does it exactly come from. However, they do know that there is a genetic predisposition to develop lupus. So if the mother has lupus, it, mm, the children have a high chance of developing themselves. This is a sometimes not always case because they know that it 
they have families where it's just a one-time occurrence. So it's, you know, one of those things that you have to think of what else plays into it environmentally. Were they um, exposed to toxins, maybe some medications, which there is sometimes you can give a patient medication and they'll develop a lupus-like syndrome, but it goes away once you remove the medication. Um, and it may also be triggered by bacteria and viruses, something to be considered and discovered. So at this moment, they're Okay, so who is going to get lupus before I start going into the clinical manifestations? Believe it or not, women, you are way more at risk than men to get this. And women of color. I'm talking African American, Asian, and even those of Native American descent. Your um, likelihood of getting lupus is 10 times greater than that of men or your, you know, the white population. Don't know why, it's just the numbers I'm reporting here. And the younger, the more likely you are to have it, particularly in your childbearing years, and I'm speaking to females, about 20 to 40 year olds um, are more likely to show uh, signs and symptoms of lupus. So what does lupus look like? And like I said, these aren't you know clear cut, black and white, but um, you know because the symptoms range so varily, it just depends on the person. So the first thing you want to see, or you're going to see, is the butterfly rash. I have a couple of pictures on my next slide of what a butterfly rash looks like. You have one in your book, but I've got another one for you. Another thing that you will notice is this Raynaud's phenomenon. This is kind of cool, just saying. What happens here is you've got um, the small vessels in the hands here will actually vasospasm and um, that vasospasm is usually in response to like cold uh, mainly cold but sometimes stress and they can either turn a white color or like a blue purple so when you hear ray nods you can have both of them and it can happen in your fingers and in your toes Raynaud's uh, phenomenon can actually occur in patients who do not have lupus, but if somebody does have it and has all these other signs and symptoms, you can work them up for having lupus. Uh, let's see, another thing I wanna talk about is the renal involvement. What makes you, uh, or what calls to your memory whenever I say renal involvement? like? If somebody is starting to have the lupus uh, or lupus nephritis, what, what is that going to look like? Well, think of somebody who's going into kidney failure. And you can think of chronic kidney failure, but it will be an acute uh, kidney failure that I'm talking about. But we're probably going to have changes in their urine output. Uh, they're going to start, you know, leaking protein into the urine. So if you take a, you know, a urinalysis, they'll have high amount of protein. Also... Uh, fluid retention if they are not uh, working with their kidneys and their kidneys are starting to become impaired they're gonna blow up and we're gonna start having edema and then you know it progresses into congestive heart failure and they'll have swelling and crackles and blah 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 we're gonna see some polyarthritis particularly in joints um, that are very small so like the hands and the knees. Those are the ones that are most commonly inflamed. But with lupus, you generally will not get deformities. So they will, you know, not get crooked and, and bent and um, out of shape. So anything else I want to talk about? This? Oh, I did mention the neurologic manifestations. These are extremely vague symptoms, I understand. However, I do want you to know that people who have lupus will just get these migraine headaches that they can't get, a, uh, can't get away from. They'll have you know, strange little psychosis episodes where um, they'll be you know, confused for a period of time during their flare-ups and the medication has to get their, their mind basically clear and back to themselves. So not unusual also to have like peripheral neuropathies in your hands and in your feet. So I believe that is it for that one. Oh, I'm sorry. So on top of the discoid or, you know, on top of having lupus systemically, you can have skin eruptions here and they will happen bilaterally. So as you can see here, um, 
Yes, he is covering himself. Thank you, sir. He has it on both hands, both forearms, both sides of his chest, and on his neck. And the the, the lesions have a very particular um, like edge to them. So you can honestly take your pencil and draw it out exactly where they are demarcated. That's, um, you know, kind of characteristic of these lupus lesions. And uh, they're, they were gonna have marked hair loss. So they'll have some alopecia. So you may even know a few people who have lupus and just, you know, think about it next time you're with them, you know, how thin or thick is their hair. But during their flare up, they'll actually lose a lot of hair. I'm pointing here like he actually has the rest of his head. Oh, here we go. This is the characteristic butterfly rash. In fact, if you remember that picture of seal that I put up, he has such a severe case of discoid lupus that he has that permanent scarring that we know him all so well for. But this is dry, rashy, scaly, um, you know, butterfly rash. <laughs> Doesn't look anything like a pretty butterfly, but that's what they call it probably because it extends down like a wing would. And this is that discoid lesion that I was speaking of earlier. See how you can just draw a line and it has this dry area? That's very characteristic of lupus. Let me get my laser here. Okay, so some assessments for lupus. I do want to mention psychologically, this is very, very hard. One, because it's unpredictable, and two, because it's chronic and progressive. So knowing those things, what do we expect our patient to think or to act or, I mean, what is their behavior going to be like whenever they figure out they have this diagnosis where they have, you know, pain in their joints and they have, um, you know, occasional, um, you know, problems with their kidneys and the flare-ups are very unpredictable and you, we're not really sure exactly what causes the flare-up. So in terms of, like, life altering this disease um, has some significance when we start talking about lupus with somebody. So um, a, a young adult women, they can probably never have anything wrong with their skin and here they get this butterfly rash that you know, will leave a permanent scar on their face. Um, another thing we will want to assess is when somebody is on steroid therapy, which will happen when they have lupus, they are going to have problems associated with chronic steroid, such as acne, um, stretch marks. They're going to have these fat pads that develop like on the back of their neck and, you know, on their, um, oh, the area, love handles. You're going to have some love handles there, um, <laughs> a donut, or just in general weight gain. So a lot of psychosocial problems we're going to need to assess what is the family and patient know of the disease, what kind of coping mechanisms do they have in play, um, you know, what kind of support groups are they already in touch with. So that's some things you want to think of when we talk about psychosocial assessment for those with lupus. There is a huge impact. Don't neglect it. Priority. Laboratory. What are you going to do in the lab? So first question I want to ask you is this, skin biopsy, would we do that for discoid lupus or systemic lupus? Hmm, time's up. It would be discoid lupus. The skin biopsy is the only significant test that you can do for the discoid lupus. Reason being, it's not a systemic disease. It's the, you know, one that's just limited to the skin. So. Skin biopsy for discoid lupus. Uh, there's a bunch of immunologic based lab tests that you can do. You don't need to know every single one of them, particularly though the ANA, which is the anti-nuclear antibody. They will draw these um, on your patient in the hospital for somebody who comes in with all these different syndromes and symptoms and they're not really sure what's going on. In fact, they may even say probable lupus or suspected lupus. Um, but yes, they will more, more than likely draw an anti-nuclear antibody. So this is just, you know, um, a test that if positive, then you're 
client may likely have a chance. In fact, um, those who have lupus, 90% of them have a positive ANA. So there are some false positives that they have. However, it is highly likely that it is some kind of um, autoimmune process such as lupus whenever you draw a positive ANA. Let's see, also you can the other immunologic based lab tests I want you to know is the serum complements. There's actually about nine of them. Um, so you have C1, C2, C3, C4, all the way up to C9. Now, whenever um, your body has some kind of autoimmune or exaggerated um, you know, inflammatory response, your uh, complements are actually going to be eaten up. So we're going to see a lower number for your uh, complements in the presence of lupus. So that's why they draw the complements to see if they're high or low. Mm, obviously we're going to check some, I don't have it down here, but a, a BUN and creatinine because remember the kidneys are the ones that are going to suffer the worst from having somebody with lupus. So is their BUN high? Is their CM creatinine high? We can check a urinalysis because the protein is going to probably come on through um, for a damaged kidney as well as hematuria. Uh, I forgot to mention that one earlier. And a CBC often will show pancytopenia, which there it's very poorly understood, but the um, these autoimmune complexes will actually attack the bone marrow. So all of the bone marrow cells are going to go downward. So you're going to have a low white blood cell, low um, red blood cell, and low platelets as well. Lastly, their body system function. So what is going to be going downhill? So they're going to be generally very fatigued. They're going to have malaise, not going to even want to get out of bed because everything just hurts. Um, probably going to complain of depression, some weight loss, and some anorexia. So be aware that this is a whole system that's going to be uh, affected when somebody Now, we can't blame a person for thinking this way, but the primary concern for a patient who has lupus are the skin manifestations of the disease. I mean, I, I guess I would classify myself as a shallow person because I think that would be the first thing that comes to mind, even though the disease on the outside is not exactly deadly, okay, it does open up the you know, risk for infection or you know your likelihood of getting an infection whenever you have um, a break in your skin integrity but you know as nursing um, and medical professionals we're focused on the kidneys however patients are very focused on the outside but well because they have to work and communicate with people so do give some attention to the cutaneous manifestations of lupus so what are we going to do for that? Well, the first thing we're going to do is apply some topical cortisone drugs or corticosteroids. They have different preparations to help reduce inflammation and promote fading of the skin lesions. Um, sometimes patients can apply the steroid cream and actually wrap up their extremity or fingers or uh, you know in saran wrap or put a glove on because this helps the medication absorb um, locally into the area that's affected. Here we have alopecia. Not really much drug therapy you can do for that. Um, wear a hat? No, just kidding. <laughs> this Quintero. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right. Plaquenil, this is another one that's very unusual. However, it does well for people who have lupus. So the other, uh, well, the generic frame name for it is hydroxychloroquine. And this is actually a drug to, um, to help folks who have malaria. So it actually is in a classification for an anti-malarial drug. However, we give it to patients who have, you know, uh, lupus and it actually, um, you know, helps them absorb more ultraviolet light and decreases the skin lesions. So if it works, use it. 
The main thing about this drug I need to mention is that the person needs frequent eye examinations. You don't want to be taking this drug, have an underlying eye problem because it can make it worse. So Plaquenil or the hydroxychloroquine, eyes. Put those two together in your mind for me. The pain and the arthralgias and the different type of myalgias that the patient's gonna have, all those muscle and joint pains, give them some Tylenol first and then give them some NSAIDs. The main thing about NSAIDs is if they have kidney involvement, meaning their BUN and gratin is high or they got protein in their urine, do not give them NSAIDs because it will make them worse. Or if they have some kind of GI bleeding, do not give them some NSAIDs. Do you hear what I am saying? Do you see what I am circling? Do not give these patients NSAIDs if they have kidney or um, GI problems. Stick to the Tylenol. However, if they have liver problems, go back to the NSAID. If they have problems with <laughs> both their liver and their kidney or GI, well then you may, <laughs> then you have to probably start talking about some um, narcotics. As you see here, the chronic steroid therapy is 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 a definite. Unfortunately, you cannot evade um, taking long-term steroids because we have to suppress the immune system. And these are some of the side effects that you see when somebody is on chronic um, steroids, such as that osteoporosis. It um, inhibits the bone to continuously regenerate itself. And so you're gonna have weak bones, brittle bones, and uh, risk for fracture. They're gonna have very thin skin, especially on their forearms. You touch them and they like have a hematoma or a bruise right there. They're gonna have this moon face that's very characteristic of somebody on long-term steroids. And those little, um, oh, I can't think of the word for it, but they'll have like little blood vessels broken all on their on their cheek. You know what that's called? Tentiki? No, ten I feel like I want to say ten tangeniosis. Okay, I'll figure it out later. <laughs> no help. I know. I'm, not, I'm trying to do something else this way. Oh, we're good. Um, but lo and behold, we have some immunosuppressive agents. Hooray! And um, one of the very first drugs come that came out. Um, well, I guess for some time. Um, is this Balinsta. This is a very new drug. However, it's a biologic, meaning it decreases their immune system. I mean, you know that from the glucocorticoids that you have to watch their immune system, but this one in particular increases their risk for a serious infection. So what goes along with that? They need to stay away from crowds, sick people. Think of your leukemia patient. What would you teach them? How would they want to care for themselves? Um, the patients need to protect their skin, uh, just in general, not only when they're on these drugs. In fact, I think in Plaquenil, I actually mentioned it increases the absorption of ultraviolet light, which I stand corrected. It decreases the absorption of ultraviolet light. I apologize if I said that wrong earlier. But yeah, these patients need to stay out of the sun. They need to protect themselves. Uh, they can go visit a um, medical cosmetologist and get special makeup for that butterfly rash and all these different lesions. I don't exactly know how you can cover that up. Um, but anyway, first thing you wanna do, always, 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 instruct the patients how to protect their skin. And second, because the manifestations that they may have for a exacerbation is fever, teach them what to do when they start having a rise in body temperature. So those are the things I need you to know about somebody who has lupus. And of course, I thought of one more thing. Women of childbearing age need to know that pregnancy can actually cause an exacerbation of the disease either during the pregnancy or after the delivery. And this is very challenging because some of the medications that we need to give to help somebody with their lupus can actually uh, cause fetal harm. So this is one of those little ethical dilemmas here. You know, how can somebody with lupus, um, you know, d decide to family plan? I mean, it's not recommended, however, um, you know, many people make the decisions to go ahead with it depending upon their severity of lupus. So, to procreate or not procreate, that is the question. 
One of the next diseases we're going to touch on is scleroderma. Sounds interesting. Um, in fact, if you you know go back to your medical terminology, this would be hardening of the skin. However, the skin is only one of many systems and organs that is affected by this disease. It's this chronic, um, very uncommon, I just want to mention that, inflammatory autoimmune connective tissue disease. It actually looks very similar to lupus whenever it's first beginning and many times the person is diagnosed as having lupus until the disease progresses just a little bit more. And at that time they can see that things become fibrotic and uh, hard. So that's a little bit of the distinguishment between scleroderma and lupus. Uh, actually, I wanna tack on to what I just mentioned there. So this person you think has lupus and then you start treating them as if they have lupus. However, you notice that they don't respond well to steroids, meaning the flare up does not go under control. All of the symptoms kind of maintain and sustain and um, are just you know, raging within a person. The other thing I want to mention is the, also the other immunosuppressant. So if you give them all of those biologics, none of those can touch this person. Therefore, this disease actually has a higher mortality rate than does its cousin lupus. And the renal, uh, excuse me, the kidney involvement is the number one reason of these patients dying because the kidneys, you know, once they harden up, they're gone. Goodbye. Goodbye. We are not exactly sure what precipitates development of this, you know, uncommon disease. Um, possibly family history. Not really sure about this one. And it is not prevalent in uh, one race or the other. So it affects whites as it affects blacks and uh, Native Americans, the whole gamut, Hispanics. So, um, you know, as uncommon as it is, all races are affected. I will say women um, get it more than men. So that's a little bit of the prevalence and history behind it. There are two types of scleroderma. You have the diffuse scleroderma. Um, this is where the skin gets very thick around the trunk and the face and the distal extremities. In fact, um, one of the very first signs that you have with diffuse cutaneous uh, scleroderma, or I should start saying it's systemic sclerosis because that's more of the terminology they want you to use now versus scleroderma because this means just skin involvement, but it's a systemic condition. So with diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis, one of the very first things you'll see is like sausage fingers. So their hands and their forearms will become extremely swollen and just um, look quite large. And they'll more than likely have carpal tunnel syndrome from the connective tissue that's being attacked by the body. The other form of systemic sclerosis is the limited cutaneous. This one is not as serious um, as the diffuse one. However, these in the limited will develop the Crest syndrome. And uh, that's there on page 317 that talks about some of the um, clinical manifestations of what it is to have limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis. Say that one five times fast. I'll have some pictures I'll show you. Here I've got some pictures of the diffuse cutaneous uh, scleroderma. Oh, excuse me, I said I wasn't gonna say that. Systemic sclerosis, there we go. So you've got the thickening of the skin on the trunk. Um, you know, on their hands, they'll actually have some um, restrictions because they have those sausage-like fingers and you won't see any kind of um, wrinkles on their knuckles or their other phalanges. So just be looking for that, and they're gonna have some difficulty swallowing. So they will not be able to um, take normal kind of food that you would suspect for um, you know, somebody to keep up nutrition. So we're looking at possibly altering their diet for altered swallowing that they're going to have. Here, 
Remember we saw a picture of somebody with lupus and what their hands look like with the sores? This sort of looks like it. What this is is the periungual lesions that people will get around their nail beds. So it'll be sore, it'll be red. Um, however, this does not respond to therapy. That's the difference here between uh, systemic sclerosis and lupus. Um, another, well, that's what the uh, limited type Mm, what else do I want to add to this? Uh, your person is their presentation is going to be so different. It really varies. However, it's going to be painless, symmetric, pinning edema of the hands. Um, you know, especially if they're in the diffuse form of the disease. That. All right. So if they have the limited cutaneous uh, systemic sclerosis, this is that Crest syndrome that I was speaking of. So they'll have these calcium deposits in their skin. Um, you know, kind of dry and white areas, then they're going to have that Raymond, uh, Raynaud's phenomenon that I mentioned earlier. However, I do want to throw in here that they can actually, if the vasculitis is so severe, uh, there's such a thing as auto amputation, like the digits will turn black and necrotic and fall off. So um, this person needs to stay away from cold or wear mitts, um, even sometimes the response to cold can be just walking into an air-conditioned building. So this person needs to have gloves with them on at all times. Um, what else do I want to mention here? This right here, the sclerodactyly, um, I don't know, just off the top of my head, it kind of reminds me of a pterodactyl hand. So you can kind of just do a play on words there. Sclerodactyly is like a pterodactyl, kind of like a claw hand. But this person is going to have some mobility issues and um, may even need vocational therapy because um, they may not be able to perform their job. Now, this is what I was trying to mention earlier to Ms. Quintero. It's telangia tixasis. So you'll have like these little spider veins with like a red center to it. Uh, systemically, we're going to have renal involvement. As I mentioned earlier, however, this is what is probably going to bring them into the hospital because they're going to go into renal failure. The, um, the, the kidneys are going to become fibro fibrotic. Also, the whole, all of the body, the vessels, they're becoming fibrotic as well. So your person's going to have malignant hypertension. So this person's going to come in, you can't get their blood pressure under control, um, their kidneys are not responding to you know, diuretics to get some of the fluid off of them. So we're going to be looking for signs and symptoms of impending organ failure. Um, they're, they're, when they go down, they're going to go down quick. And it's generally because of the kidneys and heart that go along with it. As for the lung involvement, yes, we do have problems with the lungs. This is because of the pulmonary hypertension that develops. So the blood on the right, uh, when it comes from the right side of the heart, just can't get pushed into the pulmonary uh, system because there's so much pressure and the arteries inside are clamping down. So your person's what, gonna be hypoxic maybe? Um, and start having signs and symptoms of um, you know respiratory distress. So that's another thing you've gotta look for when somebody has scleroderma. Can't cure it, this is a progressive disease. Um, you know, just treat their pain, support them fluid management, you know, lower their sodium intake, um, you know, make sure they take their drugs, their, medica their medications, change their diet. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, for the, the Raynaud's, you know you need to prevent the, the person from having uh, cold exposure, so they need to wear gloves, as I mentioned. Mm. Skin care, we are gonna have those skin lesions. We need to make sure that they are using mild soap, gentle lotions, no special foo-foo, you know, smelly stuff, and um, to always inspect their skin and be looking for signs and symptoms of an infection because their skin integrity is broken down. Okay, time to wake you guys back up because I'm sure this is getting kind of long, but hey, that's how it goes. Quick question for you. Which group of people is more likely to have lupus? Ms. Quintero, if you've been listening to my lesson, 
which group of people is more likely to have lupus? African American men, African American women, Caucasian men, or Caucasian women? African American women. <laughs> okay, so she goes with African American women. Answer is B, yes, African American women. Very good. Okay, let's uh, quiz Miss Quintero again. Oh no. <laughs> Next question. A client is diagnosed with systemic lupus erythematous, uh, or, uh, oh God, erythematosus. Wow. Which instruction would be included in the teaching plan for a client? Listen to it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is it A, wear large brimmed hats when exposed to the sun? B, use tanning beds instead of sunbathing outside? C, Remove all rugs, curtains, and dust collecting items at home. Or D, carry injectable epinephrine at all times in case of exacerbation. For systemic? Mm -hmm. Hmm. That's the one that's systemic, not the skin. So the rugs, removing the dusty rugs and stuff? Or would it be the hat? I want to see the hat. <laughs> it's the hat. Wear um, large brimmed hats. You said don't wear hats. No. <laughs> that's, that's if you have alopecia, you can oh, cover the right. hat. So you want to wear large brimmed hats when yeah, exposed to the, to the sun because it decreases, yes, their exposure to yeah. ultraviolet oh, light, um, which may <laughs> precipitate a exacerbation. Thank you, Ms. Quintero. <laughs> Okay, which clinical manifestation would cause the nurse to suspect that the client is diagnosed with systemic lupus? Is it A, joint edema and tenderness, B, red burning teary eyes, C, chest tightness with wheezing on expiration, and D, fever and night sweats? Her answer, I'll let you answer first. Answer is A, joint edema and tenderness. Mm -hmm. Multiple body systems are involved whenever you have lupus, particularly the musculoskeletal system is involved, and they'll have tenderness, edema, and morning stiffness. This is probably allergic rhinitis, this is some asthma, and this is either tuberculosis or HIV AIDS. Okay, let's go with another question here. I'm going to read it for you. When caring for a patient with systemic sclerosis, the nurse knows it is important to instruct the patient related to select all that apply. I'll let you read them. Do you select the ones you wanted? Okay, the answer is, pause if you need more time, but the answer is B, C, D, and E. It is everything except A. A goes along with gout. B, we have a patient who's going to have trouble swallowing because of the uh, scleroderma. Uh, so they need to take in small, frequent meals, uh, make sure that the texture is altered so they don't aspirate. We have protecting the extremities from hot and cold. Remember the Raynaud's? I didn't clarify in the question whether it was the limited, uh, what was the two types, the diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis or if it was the limited so I was speaking generally um, but this person um, is at risk for Raynaud's so we want to protect the extremities maintaining joint function and preserving muscle uh, yes particularly because they're going to have the um, I pronounce that again scleral dactyly so they're going to have the hands that are kind of in the shape of a claw now E is actually correct because this is a connective tissue disease and um, we want this person to continue to stretch the mandibular uh, joint in their jaw. Uh, exercises on a perform, you know, on a daily basis. So 
even though I did not mention that in the earlier slides, I want this to be a teaching tool for you guys to, to know that this is also something that the patient can do. Okay.